So anyway, uh, Tom is going to talk to us today about uh, climate change and how it's affecting birds. And I'm sure you all know, but birds all over the world are just, their numbers are being decimated for a number of reasons. So I will let Tom take it away and tell us what's going on. So thank you so much, Tom, for coming to visit us. Uh, Jill, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, we actually scheduled this talk last year, which was, would have been in person. Um, and something in 2020 interrupted that uh, and interrupted a lot of things. So uh, I, I far prefer to do these presentations in person where I can see and interact with the audience, but um, we um, will do it this way. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'll get there in a second. Okay, can you see that? Yes, I can. Great, okay. Uh, well, um, I guess I'll start by saying that I'm not a climate scientist. I'm not a scientist at all. I'm really a birder and a retired one at that. Uh, so uh, I I'm sure that uh, there's a lot of people on this uh, uh, presentation tonight who know a lot more about climate science than I do, but uh, I'm gonna try to convey what the impacts are of our changing climate on, on birds. And, uh, and let you know what's going on. So birds have been our messengers uh, throughout history. They uh, tell us when the seasons are changing. Uh, they uh, announce the morning light with their beautiful song. And they tell us when something is wrong. They are truly the canary in the coal mine. Uh, and sadly, the birds that we love are, are in trouble right now. And they can't speak, but uh, they are telling us in other ways um, uh, that, that they are in trouble. Uh, so they, birds always face a lot of challenges, but right, right now the, the biggest challenge they face is climate change. So in 2014, uh, Audubon released a seven-year study uh, on birds and climate change. And, uh, oops, well, what's going on here? Okay. For some reason I've, I'm going to stop sharing and try it again because it uh, hung up there. Ah, I don't know what's going on. Okay. Sorry. <clears throat> so they uh, released this uh, birds and climate uh, study in 2014, and uh, they used four decades of uh, community science observation of birds about where they are uh, and combined these bird sightings with a uh, uh, a full range of climate data, uh, and not really just uh, temperatures, precipitation for four seasons of the year, and, and considered the, uh, what uh, uh, climate uh, conditions that birds needed to both survive and to thrive. Um, yeah, well, that works. That, who knows? So every bird really has a set of uh, environmental conditions that that enable to thrive and really climate gover governs it all. So if it's too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry, uh, birds simply cannot thrive. Uh, they have evolved over a, a very long period of time, millions of years, uh, and are adapted to a very specific set of, of climate conditions. Uh, so this study looked at 588 species of birds in North America <clears throat> and reached the conclusion that 314, more than half, of the bird species are threatened by climate change. And of those, 188 were projected to lose 50% of their climate suitable range by 2080. And 126 were projected to lose 50% of their climate suitable range by 2050, which is really not that far away. Uh, uh, not that far away for some of you who are on this call and certainly not that far away for your children. Um, and then in uh, 2019, uh, Audubon released a second study, a, a much more comprehensive and robust study uh, called Survival by Degrees. And I would encourage you to just go to Google Audubon Survival by Degrees and you can read all about it. This one looked at uh, 604 species uh, and concluded that 389 of those, which is just right at 65%, are really at risk of extinction uh, if, climate, if, if global warming reaches three degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, that's a kind of a terrifying thought given where we are right now. Um, 
Uh, in the last four centuries, we've had nine species of birds go extinct in North America. Uh, nine is more than I would like, uh, but it's not a huge number. Uh, and Audubon is not projecting how many birds might go extinct, but clearly uh, a large number of, number of them are at risk of extinction <clears throat> if we can't take action <clears throat> to control the climate, uh, the global warming. Now, once again, not quite sure what's going on with my back and forth. Uh, we'll see what happens here. So, uh, <clears throat> so I think I might have gone one slide too far. No, I'm, I'm okay. Sorry, folks. Uh, so as I said, <clears throat> It, it, in the first study, they really looked really looked at where birds are at, at bird data, and, and they looked at some real basic climate information, pre precipitation and, and temperature over four seasons. Well, this time they looked at uh, some more sophisticated climate projections, but they also brought in some other factors, including human land use, including habitat. Uh, habitat was not considered in the last study, and clearly uh, habitat for birds is, is a critical component. Uh, they looked at sea level rise and uh, water issues. Um, and they brought in a lot of data, a lot more data than from the first study. So there were more than 70 data sets uh, with more than 140 million observations. And it is uh, uh, far and away the, the largest uh, data set uh, uh, to, to look at the impact of climate change on birds that's ever been pulled together. Um, a, the, uh, the data, the, the study was done at a one kilometer uh, resolution, which was much higher resolution than what they did initially. Um, quite. Still doesn't like moving forward with my computer. Uh, so they really looked at uh, three warming scenarios. Uh, one being the 1.5 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. Uh, that was the goal that was set for the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, I think we're back in the Paris Climate Agreement, although I'm not sure that's uh, official yet, but we certainly intend to be. And then they consider it also two degrees above uh, pre-industrial levels and three degrees above that. Uh, so this slide is probably out of date by now. Some of you might tell me otherwise. Uh, when I first pulled this together, we were at about uh, uh, one degree above pre-industrial levels. Uh, I suspect we've already reached 1.5 at this point. And certainly if we have not, most scientists agree that, that uh, 1.5 uh, is, is imminent and probably the best we can hope for. Um, but we shall, we shall see. Um, so I'm only gonna show two graphs. Uh, this one is really, uh, global mean surface temperature over uh, 130 years or so. And uh, as I think all of you probably know, I think the five or six or seven uh, warmest years, recorded years have, have occurred in the last five or six or seven years. So, um, so why are these rising temperatures a threat to birds? Uh, well, what happens at these, as the, as the, uh, temperatures rise, it really alters the distribution of plants and insects that birds uh, need for uh, nesting, protection, and food. Uh, so I often get the comment that uh, somebody will say, well, Tom, birds can fly. Why don't they just fly north or fly to a place where there's a better climate? Um, well, there's some truth in that. In fact, there's some evidence that, that birds are moving their winter range further north, uh, but these are not necessarily a solution because there are a lot of other problems. For one thing, habitat does not move, or at least not quickly. Certainly habitat will change as, as global warming uh, occurs or any kind of climate change occurs, but not nearly uh, as fast as, as the birds might need it to change. Um, and existing human development um, uh, uh, may not allow for birds uh, to, to find a habitat that suits them. You know, Chicago's not going anywhere. And on the coast, uh, if their sea level rise, it, it can take a significant amount of time for that marshland and that bird habitat that, that the, our coastal uh, nesters need uh, to resurface. And it may not because it, they may run into human development uh, and, and limit that uh, uh, availability of, of habitat altogether. Uh, and in terms of up, 
we have golden crown kinglets and west winter wrens that nest at Mount Mitchell, breed at Mount Mitchell at very high elevations. Well, there is no more up. Uh, but the reality is that climate change really uh, works on individual birds uh, as opposed to species. So uh, birds are faithful to where they're born, like some of us. Uh, and, and birds are often going to return right back to that same area where, they're, where they were born. And, and birds can't read the paper and the scientific uh, journals. So they don't really know that climate change is occurring. Uh, they may see the same general habitat and, and kind of not realize that, that the uh, climate is affecting the food supply and, and therefore um, uh, their, their breeding is simply not as successful. They're just uh, fledging success drops. So studies have shown that um, when, when, when birds produce about 1.7 successfully uh, fledged 1.7 birds from their nest, uh, then the, the population of that species can uh, remain constant. If it drops to just 1.4 successful fledglings, uh, then there can be a significant reduction in, in the number of, uh, in the population of that bird. So, um, so it's really these individual birds that um, are, are subject to this. Um, it's my last graph, uh, but really it's the most compelling evidence of, of, of uh, uh, global warming that I've seen. Uh, and it shows CO2 concentrations both during ice ages and warming periods for the past 800,000 years. <clears throat> and with another group, I might get into an explanation of, of what CO2 concentrations mean, but I think all of you probably are aware that uh, the higher the CO2 concentrations, uh, uh, the more heat is trapped and the, and the higher our temperatures go. <clears throat> and so if you look at that graph, you'll see that uh, more than 300,000 years ago was the highest previous concentration of parts per million, about 300 parts per million CO2. And, and yet in recent years, uh, it has gone sky high. Um, 2018, it was 407. I think in the last couple of years, it's gone up uh, some notch from them. Uh, but the real point is that people will say, well, uh, you know, global warming is just a, a, a regular change in climate that occurs all the time. Well, it's not. This is really not normal. Uh, and it's certainly not something that birds have faced uh, over their history. Uh, and in addition, it just seems like we're seeing more and more severe weather events. It's hard to pick up the paper and not read a story about uh, a, a superstorm, uh, about increasing number of, of uh, uh, hurricanes, and about major fire events, very intense ones, about flooding, and of course about uh, the, the uh, ice uh, melting in, um, in, in the Arctic and in the uh, Antarctic. Uh, so uh, there, there are clearly things going on out there. So this study, in addition to considering uh, all of those, looked at what they call climate-related threats uh, and, and applied that in the model that was developed. Uh, so they looked at a couple of water changes, both sea level rise in the oceans, but also the Great Lakes uh, level change. <clears throat> they looked at a couple of uh, 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 human use impacts. So increased urbanization, and clearly as population grows and, and development occurs, uh, we're taking up more and more land, humans are. Uh, cropland expansion to feed us and, and the people around the world that we try to feed, uh, again, takes away habitat. And then there are these extreme weather events that really have a significant impact on birds. You know, it can be extreme spring heat or spring drought or fire, and it can even be heavy rain. So even if the average annual rainfall remains about the same, if a large portion of that comes during heavy rain events, <clears throat> that can really impact uh, birds that are nesting in the spring and they may lose their nest and lose their, 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 their babies, their young ones. Uh, fall, spring, uh, it can, can have a similar effect. So the study looked at uh, multiple climate related threats and uh, <clears throat> you can see what's here. 97% of the species in that study uh, would be affected by more than one of these threats under the three degree centigrade warming scenario. Uh, to show it. another one uh, uh, of these threats facing the birds, uh, 305 of those species, which is more than half, uh, would face three or more climate change threats uh, or climate threats. And, and whereas if we can keep it to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, uh, only 34 bird species would face three or more of these threats. 
And they also did some vulnerability assessment of habitats. Uh, uh, and I'm only going to show the highly vulnerable uh, slide. Uh, you can go to the uh, survival by degrees report and see the moderately vulnerable or low vulnerable. Uh, but you can see that in the Arctic and the boreal forest, essentially every species up there is highly vulnerable. Um, it seems that uh, climate change is kind of affecting the, the northern latitudes more than anywhere else. Water birds are in there too because so many of our water birds actually breed at, at high elevations. So I'm going to show some examples. Wood thrush, don't know how many people, how many of you have ever seen a wood thrush or heard their beautiful song. Uh, this map's a little difficult to read, but the wood thrush breeds all across North Carolina and in fact all across the eastern United States. So really on these two projection maps, all you really need to look at is the, is the red colors because that represents the range loss, the projected range loss at 1.5 degrees centigrade, the projected range loss at three degrees centigrade. And you can see the significant difference in those uh, in terms of uh, the range loss that the wood thrush would experience. And to bring it closer to home, uh, uh, in the worst case, uh, the wood thrush would essentially be wiped out for 90% of its breeding habitat in North Carolina. And only in Western North Carolina would it remain in all probability. I don't know how many of you have ever seen a bobolink. This is a grasslands bird. Uh, it's a beautiful, this is the male, it's just a beautiful bird. Uh, it does not breed in Western North Carolina, but it comes through uh, every spring and in the fall on migration heading towards breeding grounds further north. And in fact, uh, a week ago today, I saw six of these male bobolinks perched on a fence at, at uh, the Biltmore Estate. And I actually got an email today from a birding friend who, who found about 20 or 30 of them uh, in the grasslands at Warren Wilson College. So it's a wonderful thing to look forward to in the spring when they come through. Um, as I said, they breed in grasslands. Uh, this was their uh, historical breeding area, which is the northern part of the United States and southern part of Canada. And the bird survival by degrees report projects that this is going to be, the yellow now is going to be their future climate suitable habitat. Well, <clears throat> if you know a little geography, you know that that's mainly boreal forest. Well, these are grassland birds and they're not going to be successful in the boreal forest. Now, uh, climate change means that that boreal Boreal forest is going to move further north or disappear at some point. But as I said earlier, that doesn't happen nearly as fast as the bobolink would need it to happen. Uh, so they could be really severely affected uh, by climate change. And uh, I would uh, terribly miss seeing them every spring. So one of the tools that you can find in the bird and climate uh, uh, or the survival by degrees report is the bird and climate visualizer. So you can go in there and punch in your zip code and it will bring up a list of birds and pictures of them, uh, of birds in your area that are uh, uh, either vulnerable at, at three degrees or at two degrees or at 1.5 degrees. And I did this for Buncombe County. Uh, the black shows those that are uh, vulnerable at these, at these various categories, uh, whereas the red shows uh, how many would be, how many species would be vulnerable uh, if we could uh, uh, keep global warming to 1.5 degrees. So 22 here in Buncombe County, uh, it would drop to four. And one of the things interesting to me, now this brown-headed nuthatch up here in the left corner it would be vulnerable in any, in any scenario. Uh, but two of the species that would be in the high vulnerability category uh, at three degrees are an eastern towhee and a brown thrasher. And if you're not a birder, you may not be aware of these, but these are common residential birds. I have both of them in my yard, which is a mile and a half north of downtown Asheville. Uh, and it just kind of stuns me that uh, a bird that has been, that I've known to be common all my life uh, could really be that threatened. So uh, I, I sometimes give presentations to uh, schools, school groups, children. And I always ask them, you know, what's the value of birds? And I get interesting answers. And actually, most of the time, I get a lot of good answers, correct answers. And they will talk about that birds eat insects and pests, and, and birds certainly do that, and uh, uh, rodents that threaten our crops, and, and, uh, and it has a significant economic impact 
uh, for us. They also recognize that birds pollinate plants and, and that birds distribute seeds. It really helps the forest to spread uh, and to get those native seeds out there. Uh, they, they may mention um, that they are um, uh, indicators of the ecosystem health, which is very true. And they may talk about birds uh, being an economic driver, uh, you know, birds uh, uh, ecotourism. And so this, all of those are very true. Uh, in North Carolina, wildlife viewing is a billion dollar industry every year. Um, that includes people buying bird seed and bird feeders, uh, but it includes a, a lot of people that come to North Carolina to view wildlife. Well, I, I don't think there's many people that come to North Carolina to view uh, white-tailed deer or bear, although everybody in the parkway likes to see if, a bear if they can, but uh, most of these people are coming to see birds. Uh, so uh, they, they are incredibly valuable to us but probably the best answer that I ever got at a, at, a, at a school was from a young fourth grade girl. And, and her answer was birds are beautiful. And I, I think what that answer really means is that uh, birds have an inherent right to live and have their babies in this world just as much as we do. Uh, they shouldn't have to justify themselves by their economic value to humans. I have to use this one. And it's not just about birds. Uh, this quote is uh, from Pope Francis, his 2015 encyclical on climate change. Uh, so birds are indicators of, of uh, climate change, uh, but there's a huge impact on people from climate change. So vulnerable people around the world are gonna be impacted by drought, uh, by flooding, by failing crops. And we're already seeing migration of people from, from some of these factors. And this creates uh, uh, major geopolitical challenges. Uh, the, the, the U.S. military is, is uh, uh, probably more than anybody else in the, in the federal government over the last four years, uh, really aware of the impact of climate change on, on what their mission is down the, in, in the future. So this report, uh, I think a critical outcome of this report is that it gives us a lens to view ch climate change. Uh, birds are the lens, but climate change will affect all of us. Um, so uh, all these maps and, and figures have uh, uh, painted a pretty de depressing picture, um, but there is hope and the report gives us some hope. Uh, I I've always said that I'm a half glass full kind of guy and I believe there are things we can do. We know how resilient nature is. And if we give birds half a chance, they're going to survive. And the study shows that if we take action, and especially keep the global warming to no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade, uh, that 76% of the species uh, would, would have, uh, be at less risk. And that would be nearly 150 species would no longer be vulnerable to extinction. So what's the solution? Well, we already know in many ways what we need to do to protect birds. We need to protect the birds, uh, the places where birds uh, live now and will live in the future. Uh, and we begin, begin, need to begin to address the, uh, the root causes of climate change. Um, so these are Audubon's climate initiative strategies. I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but I'll talk about some of them. Uh, one of them is really starting the conversation. Uh, and that's kind of what I'm doing tonight with you folks. Uh, but, uh, you know, talking about this issue and it doesn't have to be done in, a, in an adversarial way. Um, there are still deniers out there, but I think the data shows that there are fewer and fewer that the percentage of people that recognize that climate change is real is increasing. Uh, so everyone's voice is important and uh, uh, everyone loves birds. So you can say, did you know that uh, the birds we love are under severe threat from climate change? And you can find facts on the Survival by Degrees report and other places on our Audubon websites and just kind of pop those into your social media uh, sources from time to time. Protecting climate strongholds, I just mentioned. Uh, 
So the, the model that was done really identified strongholds. These are geographic areas that provide shelter now and uh, uh, against this, uh, the threat of climate change and are gonna provide uh, uh, places in the future. As I mentioned, the, the wood thrush may, may only be able to live in Western North Carolina. We're very fortunate out here and that there's a significant amount of land out here that is still wild and is protected. Uh, lots of national forest and, and uh, 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 national parks. Uh, so protecting these climate strongholds is really a, a critical part of the strategy. And, and the other key part is, uh, is simply reducing greenhouse gases. Uh, so you can reduce your own energy use, of course, um, but really uh, taking a public stance, reaching out to elected officials, and I'm gonna get into this a little more detail uh, in a minute, uh, to really promote um, uh, alternative energy, clean energy transition, uh, and also uh, the uh, investment in battery storage technology. Uh, so one of, the, uh, one of the challenges we run into is that uh, for, for whatever reason, solar and wind have kind of become political hot buttons. And, and there are some people, uh, elected officials, that kind of uh, immediately are turned off by that. Whereas energy storage is really politically safe. You know, it's, it's, it's an investment. Uh, it, it, it leads to jobs. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, the costs are coming down. And, the, and so there's, there's great advantages. So it's one of the things that Audubon is doing at the North Carolina General Assembly is to really uh, promote the investment into battery storage. But there have been hopes uh, in, in recent years, and I'm going to mention a few of them. Uh, the state of Washington passed a bill that will phase out coal by 2025. Uh, New York has established a clean energy standard that's going to require 50% of the New York state's electricity be obtained from renewable sources by 2030. Well, these are two blue states. So perhaps not too surprising, uh, but South Carolina uh, passed an Energy Freedom Act that expands access to solar energy. Uh, Arkansas, uh, uh, not a blue state, uh, passed a solar expansion bill that will allow homeowners and businesses to generate electric energy. So these, these are great steps. And one of my favorites is a little town in Texas called Georgetown, population 67,000, uh, in 2017 became the largest state in the United States, largest city in the United States uh, to be powered entirely by renewable energy. Uh, this was led by the mayor, who I believe was a Republican. Um, and this is in a state with, which believes heavily in oil production. So there are successes out there. Uh, at the federal government level for the past four years, uh, addressing climate change has not been a priority, but actually a lot of things are going on in state governments, local governments uh, around the country. As I suspect all of you know, both the city of Asheville and Buncombe County have adopted resolutions to end greenhouse gas emissions for all city county operations by 2030. And there is some push to do that a little faster. And it even goes down to smaller levels than that. Uh, Isaac Dixon Elementary School, um, which is just not too far from my house, um, uh, they had planned to be net energy, net zero energy by 2020. I, I need to call over there and talk to my friends and see if they've reached that. I can't promise that they had yet, but they were getting close. Oops. And the in, uh, investments in battery storage. Duke Energy is, uh, has announced that they plan to invest a lot of money into battery storage. And there's a couple of companies that in two 2019, uh, uh, announced that they're going to build two large scale solar plus storage facilities in North Carolina. So there are good things happening out there, maybe not enough, but it's, it's happening. Uh, in a lot of ways, the really good news is that the younger generations are going to drive the climate movement. Um, so in, uh, I don't know if any of you attended the climate justice rally in downtown Asheville in September of 2019. Uh, I was there. This picture is not from that rally, but it really could have been. Uh, I was stunned by the number of young people there and speaking out. Uh, the fav my favorite placard uh, from that event uh, was one that read, there is no planet B. Uh, so um, the, the, the young people get it. They recognize that it's their future and their children's future. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard uh, of Greta Thunberg, the young Swedish girl, 
who has been a particularly effective voice. Uh, she spoke to the United Nations a couple of years ago, and as, as I think 16 or 17 year olds, and said, shame on you, you have stolen my dreams. So uh, I'm not sure what impact that's having on our politicians, but, uh, but the youth are gonna drive a lot of this. Uh, uh, Audubon uh, is, is working hard to lobby uh, elected officials and, and we invite all of you to get involved with that. Uh, the picture on the top left uh, shows some of our uh, Blue Ridge Audubon folks at, a, at an advocacy day with the General Assembly in Raleigh meeting with our representative Susan Fisher. And uh, uh, so we are working hard to uh, promote initiatives to the General Assembly on uh, renewable energy policies, uh, bird flooded communities, uh, increasing uh, the, the dollar commitments to uh, uh, saving uh, or protecting climate strongholds and, and acquiring new land. Uh, and our chapter uh, in 2019 adopted an advocacy plan, which was the first chapter in the state to do so. And what we're doing through that is really mobilizing our members and our supporters uh, uh, through what we call action alerts, uh, providing a forum for people to reach out to elected officials and other resource managers. Uh, so this action alerts will provide background uh, information on what the issue is, uh, the goal, what change is necessary and why, and the action desired, which might be uh, uh, sending a letter to uh, an elected official or a congressman or, or a senator in the state, a representative or senator in the state. And, and often uh, they can simply go to our website and, and open that action alert and fill in everything, uh, write it in their own words that they like and send it off. Uh, and uh, Audubon, North Carolina, the state office has uh, uh, organized what, what are called advocacy days at the General Assembly. This, this year we had our fifth one. Uh, the first three years we actually met in person. This was a picture of a part of the group, not all of them in 2019. Uh, earlier today, I looked at this picture and I counted 11 people from our chapter, which was very exciting. Uh, but uh, we, we, we uh, descend upon Raleigh and uh, appointments are scheduled with, with legislators and three, two or three or four or five of us will go in and meet with the legislature and, and promote the initiatives uh, that, that are on the table for that year. And Audubon uh, has a great advantage over a lot of uh, conservation organizations um, in, in that um, our membership really cross cuts the political spectrum. So 45% of Audubon membership in, uh, in, in both North Carolina and the nation self-identify as either conservative or moderate. And so that opens us up to welcoming uh, from elected officials because uh, they, they, they know we vote and that uh, they may be potential voters for them. Uh, so, um, yeah, I keep forgetting to hit the right button. Uh, so uh, really reaching out to elected officials through, through, through letters or email or phone calls or letters to the editor are all things that people can do. Uh, another one is to create bird friendly communities. So let me talk a little bit about uh, what that means. Um, for a hundred years, Audubon has been trying to make the world a better place for birds. And uh, in the last 30 years or so, we've become to recognize that that we need to help birds in places where people live. Um, because of uh, development and, and, uh, and increased population, there are just fewer places where uh, birds can find wild areas and open space uh, and uh, food uh, for themselves and places to raise their babies. Um, and this is especially true for our migrants that are coming through right now. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this in a second, but I want to throw in a slide uh, uh, that's kind of unrelated to climate change. Uh, the UNC Asheville Audubon chapter, which we helped establish three years ago, uh, has been working on a wonderful initiative called a Coalition for Bird Friendly Asheville. And I encourage you to go Google it. If you just Google Bird Safe Asheville, it'll come up. And they're really uh, working with the community to promote uh, bird safe window treatments uh, to help stop uh, deaths from birds flying into windows, especially in, in high rises downtown, and a lights out commitment, which really uh, uh, major lights in cities that create a real problem for birds when they're migrating. So go, go check that out. There's a really 
motivated group of students over there that are doing wonderful things. Uh, but I wanted to show you uh, uh, why it's so important that we begin to uh, help birds in places where people live. And this is a 1990 housing density map. Uh, the warmer colors, the red, the orange, and the yellow are the areas with the highest uh, uh, acres per housing unit. This is a 2030 map. I'm going to go back and do that again. So the 1990 map, it's the 2030 map. So you can see uh, why we begin, why we need need to think about helping people in cities and towns uh, where people live. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we encourage people to do, and we recognize, or I recognize, that uh, not everybody can go buy an electric car, not everybody can go install uh, solar panels on their roof, uh, but everybody can plant native plants, and, and planting native plants is, is probably the easiest thing that you can do to help birds. So why is that? This is a little Carolina chickadee. I suspect most of you have one in your yard, if you have a yard. Uh, the female generally lays about five eggs and it generally takes somewhere between 14 and 16 days from the time those eggs hatch uh, for those uh, little baby birds to grow their bones and their feathers and be ready to fly off. And during that time, <coughs> excuse me, during that time, uh, the parents have to feed them insects. They have to feed them protein. And this is true of 96% of all of our land birds. Uh, so even, even birds that are fruit eaters like uh, cedar wax wings or orioles, uh, you know, that grow up to be fruit eaters uh, or birds that grow up to be seed eaters like goldfinches or sparrows, they still have to feed their, their babies insects because they, they have to have protein just like our babies do. Uh, so insects are a critical component of that. And uh, this, uh, these seven birds, Two adults, five babies, over those 14 to 16 days, uh, will eat a lot of caterpillars. And if this were in person, I would ask everybody to guess. Um, I get widely divergent guesses when I do that, uh, but I will show you the answer. And it's 9,000 caterpillars for those seven birds. I was stunned when I read that and I immediately pulled out my calculator and did the math, figured about 14 and a half hours of daylight a day and uh, multiply that by 16 and divide that into 9,000. And it turns out that each adult uh, would have to make about 18 or 19 trips an hour. And actually they wouldn't have to make that many because that 9,000 includes the caterpillars that they eat. So they don't have to go back to the nest to eat their own dinner. Uh, so it's, it's not, it, 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 it works, uh, but it only works if there are uh, native plants that are producing those caterpillars. So, so why, do they, uh, why are the native plants so important for this? Uh, on the left is a uh, oak tree, one of many species of oak trees in this country. And it hosts 537 species of caterpillars. How do we know this? Graduate students, so support your local graduate student. Uh, the tree on the right is a ginkgo tree. It's an exotic, beautiful tree from Japan and other areas of, of, of Asia. And uh, it supports four species of caterpillars. So why is this the case? Well, our native trees and our native, our native plants and our native insects have evolved together over millions and millions of years. And when the insect lays its egg on the underside of that leaf and the, and the, and the egg hatches and that caterpillar or uh, young comes out, uh, it has evolved to develop uh, to de develop an immunity to the leaf chemistry of that native plant. It, 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 can, it can deal with the leaf chemistry. Uh, it will eat some leaves, it may cause some, dis may cause some discoloration, but it's not going to kill the plant. Uh, they have achieved a balance over all that time and, uh, and, and it all works. Uh, whereas uh, the ginkgo tree, uh, our insects have not developed the ability to deal with the leaf chemistry of that plant. And some people will say, well, we've had ginkgo trees in, in, in this country for 100 years now. Well, on an evolutionary scale, that 100 years is nothing. So who knows how long it would take for our insects to be, develop the ability to deal with that. So if, if you've got only ginkgo trees or other non-native plants in your yard, uh, essentially it's a food desert for that little Carolina chickadee. Uh, or it's a piece of furniture. 
So climate friendly yard, these are some things you can do. Uh, eliminate grass, uh, plant some native species. Um, I, I always tell people, I do a bird friendly gardening presentation as well. And I always tell people that if you have a, a non-native plant that you just love that produces great flowers or whatever, keep it. The Audubon police are not gonna walk by, right drive by and shake their finger at you. Uh, but when it comes time to replace a plant or better yet to do away with some grass, uh, then please go out and, and, and buy native and put those in your yard. So I'm basically at the end here. Uh, we'll just uh, show this picture that uh, back in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, uh, one of the traditions around Christmas, not necessarily on Christmas day, it was called the Christmas side hunt. And the men went out, I say men, I, I don't know, maybe there were some women that did it as well, but I'm, I think my generalization is probably correct. Uh, they went out and would shoot birds, lots of them. Uh, I somehow doubt that they ate all these birds. Uh, so one of Audubon's early leaders, uh, a, a man named Frank Chapman, uh, uh, in encouraged uh, people around the country to uh, replace the side hunt uh, and change it to the Audubon Christmas bird count. And that took some years, but it was successful. And the, Audubon Christmas bird count is now the longest running uh, citizen or community science uh, effort in the, in the world. Uh, so, so there are steps that people can take uh, and we've done it before. Uh, when when, when uh, uh, some bird species were threatened with extinction because uh, <clears throat> of hunting for bird plumes and uh, that, that women were wearing on their hats. We won't blame the women, we'll blame the men who like the bird plumes on their hats. Uh, and uh, uh, Audubon, you know, barely right in its infancy, it had barely been formed, uh, came together and really stopped that by helping to pass the Migratory Bird Treaty Act in 2018. So uh, we've, we've fought big challenges in the past and uh, climate change is a new one, but we can all do it together. Uh, birds sing beautifully but they cannot speak. So it really is up to us to be the voice for birds. So with that, I will quit and leave this side up so you can take a look at it. And uh, Harris or Jill, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, do I need to turn off, stop sharing my screen in order to do that? No, you can leave your uh, screen up for that slide if you want. Um, I'll, I'll leave it up for a minute and then, and then get off so I'm a little more visible. So. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tom. That was very interesting. I learned a whole bunch and it, it still makes me very sad. And I just wish, I live in a condominium association and I really wish we could plant more native species. I, I'm gonna really push for that. So I think that's really important if we all just put some perennials in that birds like, it would make a huge difference. Yes, it does. Uh, and yeah, it's just, thank you very much. And I'm gonna let, uh, Harris take over with the questions from the chat. Great. And thank yeah. you all for being here. I'll talk more in a minute, so. So our first question in the chat was from Greg Wagner, who has graciously let us use his Zoom account. Thank you, Greg. Um, is Audubon working with other environmental organizations and groups to build more unity in the movement? Yes, we, we are constantly doing that. Uh, our chapter works very closely with the American Bird Conservancy. Uh, we uh, share events on occasion with the, with the Sierra Club. Uh, so yes, it, you know, that, it, it's a great question and it's important that all conservation groups kind of uh, are on the same page. You know, our focus is a little more on, on birds uh, than it may be on water quality and some other things, but yes, we do. Great. Uh, another question from Susan Stanton. What other native trees support large numbers of caterpillars besides oaks? Cherry is, is a wonderful one, 450 some species of caterpillars. Uh, willow is another wonderful one. Um, there's an interesting example I use in my bird friendly gardening presentation uh, is, um, and, and before I go on to this one, I should say that cherry also, there are four food groups. In addition to the insects, there's berries and nuts and seeds and nectar. So cherry is a tree that produces two of those, lots of insects and, and berries as well. But, uh, but uh, crab apple is an interesting example that I use. It, it's, uh, it's, it's a native tree, but it demonstrates that 
the answer is not always black and white. Uh, native is good, but uh, non-native is bad. And so the reason for that is that there are non-native crabapple trees, uh, but they are very closely related. So their leaf chemistry is very similar. And so while they don't host quite as many caterpillars as a native um, um, crabapple, they still host a significant number. Uh, so uh, there are a number of others. Uh, if you go to our website and go to the page, it says bird friendly gardening. I've got huge list of plants and trees in there that, that would answer this question if I can't remember them all. Uh, I'll mention that uh, there are a number of trees that produce berries as well. Service berry is a wonderful small little tree that produces great berries that birds love. Elderberry is, is, is another one. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm uh, omitting a number of trees that would help answer that question, but uh, a lot of them are listed on our website. Great, thank you. Um, there's no more questions in the chat. I have a, a quick question um, that I was thinking about, you know, with um, regards to, to the temperature being the main indicator um, or effect variable on the bird populations, but would that temperature increase have such a drastic effect if it weren't, if there were more robust populations as is? Because I know with, you know, house cats, uh, human expansion and other factors like that, you know, the bird populations are, are low as is. So with more robust populations, would they be able to withstand more climate change? I, I think the answer is clearly yes. So uh, temperature and also precipitation are, are, are probably the two major uh, uh, factors that affect birds' su success or their ability to, to raise their babies. Um, so uh, there's a study that came out here, I, I believe from Cornell recently, that, that we've lost 3 billion birds over the last uh, 30 years or so. So uh, clearly not all of that is because of climate change. A lot of that is for the factors that you just mentioned, habitat loss, uh, growing population and so forth. So yeah, uh, the more birds that are out there, the better chance they have to survive. But you know, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, one, of the, one of the big challenges. And, and of course, three quarters of our birds migrate uh, to either Central or South America. And that's a perilous flight. Um, those, those, those hummingbirds, a hummingbird getting ready to leave North Carolina in October for Central America uh, weighs four and a half grams. Uh, you guys are all scientists, so you know what a gram is. To me, that's, that's two dimes. So, uh, and it flies 300, 300 miles to 500 miles in one 24 hour period, basically, uh, without stopping. Uh, so they really have to fatten up and, and they have to fatten up on a lot of nectar. Uh, and while they eat insects uh, a lot too, that nectar is what really builds up that fat. Uh, so anyway, the, the problems, I got a little off track there, but the, but the loss of habitat and the problems in, in Central and South America are contributing significantly to the, to the decrease in the number of birds. Uh, so as they, as they clear land there for, for cattle farms, as they uh, clear land and, and, and do sun, gray, sun grown coffee instead of shade grown coffee. They're, they're really, we're losing uh, habitat for those birds uh, that winter down there. And, and the, the truth is that those migratory birds, that's their home. They spend seven months there and they only spend, you know, four and a half or five months here. So, so that's, that's a real challenge is too. Great. Thank you. Um, like are there... just... Oops, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, one of the ways that we can really help besides planting bird friendly vegetation is to get the bird friendly coffee. It costs a little bit more, but it's clearly worth it. And Smithsonian and Audubon, and I think maybe even Cornell, they have sites that show you where you can get this bird friendly coffee, where it's shade grown. And that's really important for helping these birds. So uh, if you have, if you're coffee lovers, think about splurging a little bit on that. Jill, I. I... On our website, there's a, a page on uh, shade grown coffee, and, and we have about eight or ten uh, uh, roasters and, and coffee shops that have signed up that are, are places that are offering bird friendly shade grown coffee so they can go there. I, I could spend another two or three minutes talking about why shade grown coffee is so much better than, than sun grown coffee in terms of birds, but we won't go into that. So, but, but that's another wonderful thing. Well, I think we need to get you back again, Tom, to give us this bird-friendly gardening talk. 
for sure. So I'll be yeah. that, 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 that one's um, maybe a little more, a little less depressing than this one, I guess, as I'll say. Okay, that's good. We've got some thumbs up on that. So I, I think that's a great idea. I'll be back in touch with you. So okay. are there any other questions or comments? Oh, yes, Carla has a question. Oops, we have to be unmuted. Can you, un Harris, can you unmute her? There, I think I got it. Um, I just wanted to say also about the gardening. It isn't only just bird friendly when we do natural plants, it's all pollinators. We have somewhere between yes. 350 to yes. 560 different uh, pollinators here in North Carolina and those hybrids. My understanding is that the hybrids are sort of made for us and they're not made for uh, the proboscis of a moth or a butterfly. They're, they're, they change the way they make. So those naturals, the pollinators can actually work better with those and, and get more, more food and pollination. So I would love oh, you're, you're you're exactly right. And in addition to bird populations dropping, insect populations are dropping. And that could yeah. be one of the reasons. And, and let me, one thing jumped into and out of my mind, going back to Harris's comment about cats. Um, and I will tell you, I'm a cat person. I love cats, but they really ought to be indoors. And while, while the threat of climate change is significantly greater than, than the problem with cats, cats do kill 2.4 billion birds a year annually in the United States alone. That's, that's a lot of birds. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. cats will live a longer, ha happier, healthier life, maybe not happier, but a longer, healthier life inside. They're not going to be hit by cars or grabbed up by uh, a coyote or a dog or, or, or in the revenge of the birds grabbed up by a great horned owl. So, uh, <laughs> You know, they, they will do just fine indoors. And I have a neighbor up the street uh, through my conversations with him. He has a wonderful cat named Oberon from Midsummer Night's Dream. And he walks his cat three times a day on a leash. Sounds good, wonderful. Well, uh, one quick thing, next, next month, I wanna just announce next month's talk. It's going to be about um, life in the, in the International Space Station. So join us on the second Sunday of June and we'll have that talk also. Uh, if there are no further questions, we can sort of do a virtual thank you. Everybody clap your hands, whatever. Thank you so much, Tom. This is very interesting and we are definitely gonna have to get you back for the uh, bird friendly gardening. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's do it when we can meet in person so I can meet everybody. Oh. Yes, when we can meet in person, that would be wonderful. So thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day and um, we'll hopefully see you next month. Thanks. <laughs>